The Tudor dynasty ruled England from 1485 to 1603. And if we had time just to examine that, the turmoil in England during the Tudor dynasty, this little time period, made all the difference in the history of England. The Battle of Bosworth Field on August 22nd, 1485, was the last armed confrontation between the Lancastrians and the Yorkists, those two factions that had fought for decades in the War of the Roses. The Lancastrians triumphed under the leadership of a 28-year-old exile named Henry Tudor. After winning the throne of England, he wed Elizabeth of York, the eldest daughter of the dead Yorkish King Edward IV. Thus, the two warring houses were joined in marriage, and the new king took the title Henry VII. Don't go dead on me, computer. We're in real trouble here. <laughs> Despite his very questionable claim to the throne, Henry proved himself to be an able and enthusiastic king. He devoted himself to the minutiae of government, personally initiating household account books, initialing household account books. He was quite miserly, which was greatly benefited his spendthrift son, Henry VIII, 180 degrees between his father. Henry was born 1491. What's significant about the date 1491? Next year, the whole new world changes. Henry was the second son and third child of his father, Henry VII. His elder brother, Arthur, died in April 1502, and consequently, Henry became heir to the throne when he was not yet 11 years old. Now, it has been asserted that Henry's interest in theological questions was due to the bias of his early education, since he had first been destined by his father for the church. Henry was intended to be a priest. After Arthur's death, a project was at once formed of marrying him to his brother's widow, Catherine of Aragorn, who being born in December 1485 was more than five years his senior. The negotiations for a papal dispensation took some little time, and the Spanish Queen Isabella, the mother of Catherine, then nearing her end, grew very impatient. In other words, pressured the Pope. Hence, a hastily drafted brief containing the required dispensation was privately sent to Spain to be followed by some month later by a bull to the same effect, which was of a more public character in the existence of these two instruments afterwards caused complications. This whole mess began with getting Henry to marry his dead brother's widow. When his father died in 1509, Henry carried out the marriage nine weeks after his ascension, accession. He being then 18 and showing from the first a thorough determination to be his own master. It is unanimously attested by contemporaries that the young sovereign possessed every gift of mind and person which could arouse the enthusiasm of his people. His skill in many sports was almost equaled by his intelligence and his devotion to letters. Thanks partially to Henry's personality, but still more to the ability of Tom Woolsey, who soon took the first place in the council chamber, England for the first time became a European power. Behind Henry VIII was Wolsey. This man who became a priest, and in my readings, I, could never, I might be wrong, but I never found any evidence that Cardinal Wolsey had a deep spiritual life. His call to the priesthood was based on ambition, and that defined his entire life. If I'm wrong, I'd, Lord, forgive me. In 1512, Henry joined Pope Julius II Ferdinand of Spain and the Venetians in forming the Holy League against the King of France. During all this time, Henry remained in excellent terms with the Holy See. In April 1510, Pope Julius sent him the Golden Rose, and in 1514, Leo X bestowed the honorific cap and sword, which were presented with much solemnity at St. Paul's. You see, Henry was in good shape with the church. He was actually faithful. He was actually, in many ways, a committed Catholic to the end. There was, he was committed to his faith, but by his guidance and formation, there was a twist. The League, having been broken up by the selfish policy of Ferdinand, 
the king of Spain, Henry VIII now made peace with France and for some years held the balance of power on the continent, though not without parting with a good deal of money. Wolsey was made cardinal in 1515, an exercise more influence than ever. The strength of Henry's position at home had been much developed by Wolsey's judicious diplomacy. Behind Henry was almost always Wolsey. And what you see interesting in Wolsey, I'm not going to bring it all out here, but in Cardinal Wolsey, he was called, he was the chancellor, which means that he had the power in the name of the king to do almost anything. And because of his influence with Henry, he did almost anything financially, politically, in the name of the king. Later, a number of unique under-the-table type negotiations, he also became the papal legate, which meant that he could do almost anything in the name of the pope. In this one man, we had the power of the secular rule and the church rule. Does that sound familiar? Which what will happen later with Henry. Cardinal Wolsey set the model for Henry VIII. In 1521, the most prominent noble in England, the Duke of Buckingham, was condemned to death for high treason by a subservient house of peers simply because the king suspected him of aiming at the succession and had determined that he must die. The reason I quoted this is we see this understanding that if there's somebody threatening me, he's dead. The same period, Henry's prestige in the eyes of the clergy, and not the clergy only, was strengthened by his famous book, the Assertio Semptum Sacramentorum. This book was written against Luther and in vindication of the church's dogmatic teaching regarding the sacraments, the sacrifice of the mass, while the supremacy of the papacy is also insisted upon in unequivocal terms. There is no reason to doubt that the substance of the book was really there's no reason to doubt that the subs book was really Henry's. Pope Leo X was highly pleased with it and conferred upon the king the title of Fide Defensor, Defender of the Faith, which is maintained to this day as part of the royal style of the English crown. Henry defended papal authority in that book against Luther. All the success and adulation were calculated to develop the natural masterfulness of Henry's character. He had long shown to discerning eyes, like those of Sir Thomas More, that he would brook contradiction in nothing. He was very strong will. Without being guilty of notable profligacy, you can pronounce that better than me, in comparison with the other monarchs of his time, it is doubtful if Henry's marital life had ever been pure, even from the first. And we know that in 1519 he had, by Elizabeth Blount, a son whom, at the age of six, he made Duke of Richmond. He had also carried on an intrigue with Mary Boleyn, which led to some complications at a later date. <laughs> Such was Henry when, probably about the beginning of the year 1527, he formed a violent passion for Mary's younger sister, Anne. It is possible that the idea of the divorce had suggested itself to the king much earlier than this, and it is highly probable that it was motivated by the desire of male issue, of which he had been disappointed by the death in infancy of all Catherine's children save Mary. Anne Boleyn was restrained by no moral scruples. But she saw her opportunity in Henry's infatuation and determined that she would only yield as his acknowledged queen. Anyway, it soon became the one absorbing object of the king's desires to secure a divorce from Catherine. In the pursuit of this, he condescended to the most unworthy means. The only result was to give Catherine an inkling of what was in the king's mind and to elicit from her a solemn declaration that her first marriage from Arthur had never been consummated. From this it followed that there had never been any impediment of infinity to bar her union with Henry. In other words, he had, there, was, there was a marriage with Henry. There was no grounds for divorce. The collecting, collective suit was thereupon dropped and Henry now set his hopes upon a direct appeal to the Holy See, 
acting in this independently of Woolsey. See, Woolsey was for the divorce, but Woolsey's reason for the divorce was, number one, again, from my readings, that he wanted to really free the influence of Spain through Catherine on Henry, and he wanted to open the door so Henry could get married to one of the nieces of the King of France to develop that. Woolsey's push for the divorce was political, but he was oblivious to the fact that behind the door, Henry's reason for the divorce was Anne. And so when Woolsey wasn't accomplishing it, Henry went around Woolsey to the Pope. Acting in this independently of Woolsey, to whom he at first communicated nothing of his design so far as it related to Anne, William Knight, the king's secretary, was sent to Pope Clement VII to sue for the declaration of nullity of his union with Catherine, on the ground that the dispensing bull of Julius II had been obtained by false pretenses. Henry also petitioned in the event of this becoming free, a dispensation to contract a new marriage with any woman, even in the first degree of affinity, without the affinity was contracted by law whether it was contracted by lawful or unlawful connection. This clearly had reference to Anne Boleyn and the fictitious nature of Henry's con conscientious scruples about his marriage is betrayed by the fact that he himself was now applying for a dispensation of precisely the same nature as that which he scrupled about, a dispensation which he later on maintained the Pope had no power to grant. As the Pope at that time was prisoner of Charles V, the emperor, Knight, the man Henry had sent, had dif some difficulty in obtaining access to him. In the end, the king's envoy had to return without accomplishing much, though the conditional dispensation for a new marriage was readily accorded. Henry had now no choice but to put his great matter into the hands of Wolsey, who strained every nerve to secure a decision in his master's favor. The revocation of the cause to Rome in July 1529, the date is important, owing no doubt in part to Catherine's, Queen Catherine's most reasonable protests against her helplessness in England and the compulsion to which she was subjected had many important results. First among these, we must count the disgrace and the fall of Wolsey, hitherto the only real check upon Henry's willfulness. Woolsey had grown to the, almost one of the most powerful men in Europe, and then through the influence of Anne, he fell quickly because she turned Henry against him. Anne Boleyn, regarding Woolsey as responsible for the long delay, had set herself to bring about his fall. The failure of the trial rendered this possible, and during August and September, Woolsey was kept at a distance from the court and was known to be in disgrace. In November, a bill of indictment was preferred against him, and on the 19th of November, he had to surrender the great seal of England. On November 22nd, he was forced to sign a deed confessing that he incurred a premunire and surrendering all his vast possessions to the king. Now, that, that Latin word, back in 1353, a statute had been established that all subjects of the king were forbidden to plead to a foreign court in matters which the king's court could decide. And then in 1365, that included the papal court. So what they claimed that Wolsey did was that he was representing the Pope on England, and they just turned it against him, even though he had done that in the name of the king. And so the king used that, and not only Wolsey, but all the priests in the associated were under this, this uh, charge, and it required that they give up all their goods. Woolsey was one of the richest men in England. He, he built Hampton Palace for himself. All of a sudden, Hampton Palace became the king's when this happened. The incredible meanness of the premunire, Harvard's pronounced, and consequent confiscation, which the cardinal was pronounced to have incurred by obtaining the cardinalate and legateship from Rome, though of course this had been done with the king's full knowledge and consent, would alone suffice to stamp Henry as one of the basest of mankind. But secondly, we may trace to this same crisis the rise of both Cranmer and Thomas Cromwell, the two great architects of Henry's new policy. It was Cranmer who, in the autumn of 1529, made the momentous suggestion that the king should consult the universities of Europe upon the question of the nullity of his marriage. 
a suggestion which at once brought its author into favor. In other words, don't worry about what the Pope says. Let's look at the, what the universities have to say. It sounds interesting. The project was carried out as soon as possible with a lavish expenditure of bribes and the use of other means of pressure. The result was naturally highly favorable to the king's wishes. Though the universities which lay within the dominions of the emperor were not consulted, the Catholic emperor, the answers were submitted to Parliament, where the king still kept the pretense of having no personal interest in the matter. He professed to be suffering from scruples of conscience, now rendered more acute by such a weight of learned opinion. With the same astuteness, he persuaded the leading nobility of the kingdom to write to the Pope, praying him to give sentence in Henry's favor for fear that worse might follow. All this drew the king into closer relations with Cranmer, who was made ambassador to the emperor, and who, a year or two afterwards, despite the fact that he had just married Osiander's niece, his second wife, was summoned home to become Archbishop of Canterbury. And he had two wives. The necessary bulls in the pallium were obtained from Rome under threat that the law for the abolition of annates and first fruits, all the money that was paid through the bishops and the priests to Rome, would be held up. The vacillating Pope Clement, who probably hoped that by making every other kind of concession he might be able to maintain the position he had assumed upon the more vital question of the divorce, conceded bulls and pallium. In other words, he gave certain permissions. But to benefit by them, it was necessary that Cranmer should take certain prescribed oaths of obedience to the Holy See. He took the oaths, but committed to writing a solemn protest that he considered the oaths in no way binding in conscience. Now here's a quote. If, asks Dr. Lingard, it be simony to purchase spiritual office by money, what is it to purchase the same by perjury? The father of the new Church of England and future compiler of its liturgy was not entering upon his functions under very propitious auspices. But the church, which was soon to be brought into being, probably owes even more to Thomas Cromwell than to its first archbishop. It is Cromwell who seems to have suggested to Henry as a deliberate policy that he should abolish the imperium im impera, imperio, throw off the papal supremacy, and make himself the supreme head of his own religion. This was, in fact, the course which from the latter part of 1529 Henry undeviatingly followed, though he did not at first go to lengths from which there was no return. The first blow was struck at the clergy by involving them in Wolsey's premunere. Some anti-clerical dissatisfaction, there had always been, partially, no doubt, the remnants of Lollardy. This of later years had been a good deal aggravated by the importation into England of Tyndale's annotated New Testament and other books of heretical tendency, which, though prohibited and burnt by authority, still made their way among the people. Henry and his messenger Ministers had, therefore, some popular support upon which they could fall back, if necessary, in their campaign to reduce the clergy to abject submission. In the beginning of 1531, the Convocation of Canterbury were informed that they could purchase a pardon from the premunere they had incurred by presenting the king with the enormous sum of 100,000 pounds. That's a lot of bucks in today's dollars. Further, they were... They were bidden to recognize the king as, quote, protector and supreme head of the Church of England, unquote. Convocation struggled desperately against the demand and in the end succeeded in inserting the qualification, quote, so far as is allowed by the law of Christ, end of quote. But this was only a brief respite. A year later, Parliament under pressure passed an edict forbidding the payment to the Holy See of annats and first fruits, but the operation of it was for the present suspended at the sovereign's pleasure. And the king was meanwhile solicited to come to an amicable understanding with his holiness on the subject of the divorce. The measure amounted to a decently veiled threat to withdraw this source of income from the Holy See altogether if the divorce was refused. What's that called? Male. Still the Pope held out, and so did the Queen. Only a little time before, 
a deputation of lords and bishops, of course by the king's order, has visited Catherine and had rudely urged her to withdraw the appeal in virtue of which the king, contrary to his dignity, had been cited to appear personally at Rome. But though deprived of all counsel, she stood firm. In the May of 1532, further pressure was brought to bear upon convocation and resulted in the so-called submission of the clergy, by which they practically renounced all right of legislation except independence upon the king. An honest man like Sir Thomas More could no longer pretend to work with the government and to resign the chancellorship which he had held since the fall of Wolsey. The situation was too strained to last, and the end came through the death of Archbishop Warham in August 1532. In the appointment of Cranmer as a successor, the king knew that he had secured a subservient tool who desired nothing better than to see the papal authority overthrown. Anne Boleyn was then pregnant, and the king, relying no doubt on what Cranmer, when consecrated, would be ready to do for him, went through a form of marriage with her on the 25th of January, 1533. Now that's January. On April 15th, Cranmer received consecration. On May 23rd, Parliament having meanwhile forbidden all appeals to Rome, Cranmer pronounced Henry's former marriage invalid couple months after the marriage. On May 28th, he declared the marriage with Anne valid. On the 1st of June, Anne was crowned. And on September 7th, she gave birth to a daughter, the future Queen Elizabeth. Let's see, January, February, March, April, May, June. <laughs> Pope Clement who had previously sent to Henry more than one munition upon his desertion of Catherine, issued a bull of excommunication on July 11th, declaring also his divorce and remarriage null. In England, Catherine was deprived of her title of queen, and Mary, her daughter, was treated as a bastard. Much sympathy was aroused among the populace to meet which severe, severe measures were taken against the more conspicuous of the disaffected. In the course of the next year, the breach with Rome was completed. Parliament did all that was required of it. Annates, Peter's Pence, and other payments to Rome were finally abolished. An act of succession entailed the crown on the children of Anne Boleyn. And an oath was drawn up to be exacted of every person of lawful age. It was the refusal to take this oath, the preamble of which declared Henry's marriage with Catherine null from the beginning, which sent Moore and Fisher to the tower and eventually to the block. A certain number of Carthusian monks, brigantines, and observant Franciscans initiated their firmness and shared their fate. All these have been beatified in modern times by Pope Leo XIII. There were, however, but a handful who were thus true to their convictions. Declarations were obtained from the clergy in both provinces that the Bishop of Rome hath no greater jurisdiction conferred upon him by God in this kingdom of England than any other foreign bishop while Parliament in November declared the king supreme head of the Church of England, and shortly afterwards, Cromwell, a layman, was appointed vice general to rule the English church in the king's name. Though the people were cowed, their measures were not carried out. These measures were not carried out without much dissatisfaction, and to stamp out any overt expression of this, Cromwell and his master now embarked upon a veritable reign of terror the martyrs already referred to were most of them brought to the scaffold in the course of 1535. There followed a visitation of the monasteries, unscrupulous instruments like late and lay and price being appointed for the purpose. They played, of course, into the king's hand and compiled comparata, abounding in charges of disgraceful immorality, which have been shown to be at least grossly exaggerated. They made up things as the motive to tear down the monasteries. In pursuance of the same policy, Parliament in February 1536, acting under great pressure, voted to the king the property of all religious houses with less than 200 pounds a year of annual income, recommending that the inmates should be transferred to the larger houses where, quote, religion happily was right well observed, end of quote. The dissolution, when carried out, produced much popular resentment especially in Lincolnshire and the northern counties. Eventually, in the autumn of 1536, the people banded together in a very form formidable insurrection known as the Pilgrimage of Grace. The insurgents rallied under the device of the five wombs, 
and they were only induced to disperse by the deceitful promises of Henry's representative, the Duke of Norfolk. The suppression of the larger monasteries rapidly followed, and with these were swept away numerous shrines, statues, and objects of pious veneration. On the pretext of these were purely superstitious. It is easy to see that the lust of plunder was the motive which prompted this wholesale confiscation. Meanwhile, Henry, though taking advantage of the spirit of religious innovation now rife among the people whenever it suited his purpose, remained still attached to the sacramental system in which he had been brought up. In 1539, the statute of the six articles enforced under the severest penalties such doctrines as transubstantiation, communion under one kind, auricular confession, and the celibacy of the clergy. The king was still defending these. Under this act, offenders were sent to the stake for their Protestantism just as ruthlessly as the aged Margaret, Countess of Salisbury, was attained by Parliament and eventually beheaded simply because Henry was irritated by the denunciations of her son, Cardinal Pole. His mother was killed because of his commitment to the church. Neither was the king less cruel towards those who were nearest to him. Anne Boleyn and Catherine Howard, his second and fifth wives, perished on the scaffold, but their whilom lord only paraded his indifference regarding the fate to which he had condemned them. On the 30th of July, 1540, of six victims who were dragged to Smithfield, three were reformers burnt for heretic doc heretical doctrine, and the other three Catholics hanged and quartered for denying the king's supremacy. Of all the numerous miserable beings whom Henry sent to execution, Cromwell, perhaps, is the only one who fully deserved his fate. <laughs> Looking at the last 15 years of Henry's life, it is hard to find one single feature which does not evoke repulsion. And the attempts made by some writers to whitewash his misdeeds only give proof of the extraordinary prejudice with which they approach the subject. Henry's cruelties continue to the last and so likewise did his inconsistencies. One of the last measures of confiscation of his reign was an act of suppression of chantries, you know, chapels. But Henry, by his last will and testament, established what were practically chant chantries to have masses said for his own soul. <laughs> There's a summary of Henry. Now, we've got a little moment or two. I wonder if any of the other speakers here would like to add a comment. Anything else that it just needed to be said about this situation with Henry? You have to have a Brit say something about Henry VIII, right? <laughs> I'm Joanna Bogle, uh, and I am uh, English. And... Um, <laughs> And back home, they all talk like this, so just get used to it, frankly. <laughs> I think one of the most important things to understand was what Henry VIII did to the monasteries. We talk about the disillusion of the monasteries, and this is a rather silly phrase. It'd be better to say the closure of the monasteries, the sacking of the monasteries, and with it, all the welfare system that existed at that time. If you were poor and hungry and ill, you went to the monasteries. And you can still see these great, and I may say absolutely magnificent, of course, ruins all over England, and they are well worth visiting. If you go to Jervo in Yorkshire, you'll find there's very little of it left because it was blown up by gunpowder because the abbot of Jervo led the pilgrimage of grace. Nearby, you'll find Rivo, which was absolutely magnificent, uh, great monastery, still there, or Easby on the banks of the River Swale at Richmond, where finally, after 800 years, they had mass again a few years ago, yes, in the ruins. And uh, all over England, there are these fabulous great monasteries and abbeys, and there's this idea that somehow, oh, well, they're ruins, you know, it's nice to have ruins, you know, people build ruins, and they were not deliberately built as ruins, <laughs> they were built as abbeys, and this idea that there are lots of lovely Gothic ruins that, like Jane Austen has, you know, in Northanger Abbey, remember, in the novel, and Catherine Morland, the heroine, and how spooky it is, that marvellous description of her waking at night and being frightened, and the oaken chest, 
People in the 18th century thought that ruined abbeys were one of the things that an Englishman had to have in his garden, you know, and so on. But it, they were actually functioning abbeys, and they were uh, closed by the king. And who suffered? Well, the monks and the nuns, too, because women were the first to suffer their education, the reputation of women for learning, for music, for art, for culture, for medicine, all went. Suddenly great centers of womanly heritage, all gone, all gone, no place for women in the new church. But above all, the people who suffered were the poor. And under Elizabeth, they had to introduce a poor law for the first time to deal with poverty and vagrancy in our country, in my country, because the poor had nowhere to go. So we do need to think about Henry principally as an oppressor of the poor. And I think that's a, a social aspect that really needs to be understood, that it was very, very difficult. To, it was always jolly difficult to be poor. It's not much fun being poor now, is it, frankly? But the point is that you, then as now, you could go to the church. You could go to the church. And you went to the monastery and they would feed you and they would look after you. And I think this is now being slightly better understood in Britain because uh, did they get the um, rather nice television series Brother Cadfail? Uh, well, do you remember Brother Cadfail? His, he gives you medicine, doesn't he? He looks after you. He's obviously rather romanticized, but that was to that extent true. So whenever you think about Henry, of course we know his six wives, divorced, beheaded, died, divorced, beheaded, survived. That's the way we were, ta <laughs> we were taught at school. But don't forget the poor. Don't forget the poor of England because they were the ones who suffered. And that understanding that the church is there for the poor is something that Catholics should be jolly proud of because we're jolly well still there and you know, Mother Teresa's still fishing in the gutter to pull people out and looking after you and me when we're poor. So that's what Henry managed to do to England was to deprive the poor of their rights. You know, the two of the things that I always think of... Uh, when I also think of this is that often you'll see pictures of, of the, I don't know, what you call them, the middle class royalty and, the, and their great old homes and their stolen property because they were at, you know, they were abbeys, right, at one time, these great huge homes. The other thing is, how many of you read Dickens and all those stories of the poverty and the poor? That poverty and the poor came about because of what Henry did. You know, Charles, that whole David Copperfield thing. You know, and uh, so anyways, Paul. Great opportunity for a commercial. <laughs> this is my latest book. It's called Last Words, Final Thoughts of Catholic Saints and Sinners. And a number of the people that we're talking about this weekend have their last words in here. Thank you. But I, I wanted to share with you the last words of Henry VIII because they are quite telling. They're in a chapter uh, in which I've collected last words of regret. And you might even say despair in his case. His last words on his death board, as, as recorded, all is lost. Monks, monks, monks. So now all is gone. Empire, body, soul. Mm -hmm.